Um, ladies and gentlemen to today's tutorial now today we want to look at bones of the skull the bones of the skull are essential going to protect the brain going to accommodate you know the eyes the nose and the oral structures yes I mean they are organized into two group of bones we have the cranial bones essential going to protect the brain therefore developmental we call it neurocranium then we have the facial bones which you know most of them are irregular they are going to you know give accommodation to the eyes the nose and the oral structures and therefore we call it visceral cranium now the cranial bones are actually you know 18 normal facial bones being 14 together making a total of you know 22 bones of the skull now let's begin with the facial bones sorry the cranial bones so bones forming the cranium they are actually you know flat bones essentially but some areas are quite flatter and therefore we give the description squamous part now this is a frontal bone of course because the first bone which you know going to form the forehead so there's a frontal bone this frontal bone is actually yes forming part you know the anterior aspect of the roof of the cranial cavity you know as well as even the anterior wall of the cranial cavity then as it goes as it descends it gives this ridge that you can find here or here this ridge that you find is a thickening of the frontal bone forming what you call supra orbital margin because it's above this orbital socket that you find here so supra orbital margin now this supra orbital margin in life Yes, will be interrupted by what you call a foramen, which is known as supraorbital foramen. But sometimes this foramen is incomplete, therefore it forms a notch, supraorbital notch. Now, whether or not being you know foramen, it is going to you know transmit what you call supraorbital nerves and vessels. Nerve and vessels will go through this supraorbital foramen. Now. What happens is that yes in between these two supraorbital foramen uh, sorry supraorbital margins supraorbital margins is going to be an area over here which is usually most people is hairless some people will have hair around this area known as gabella gabella and if you go below it there is a suture which is actually connecting these bones which will come to they are the nasal bones connecting the nasal bones to the frontal bone known as the, the, the frontal nasal suture the anterior aspect known as the nation 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 n-a-s-i-o-n nation now yes what you find is that above the supra orbital margins okay it's an area over here where you know the eyebrow you know will grow therefore you call this area supra ciliary arch supra ciliary arch now the thickened portion okay which is formed the supraorbital margins will actually move inferiorly move inferiorly a bit but goes posteriorly into the orbital socket forming the roof of the orbit the orbital cavity the roof of the orbital cavity now having talked about the orbit the orbit is actually its wall is formed by seven bones and these seven bones yes the roof is formed by what you call the frontal bone and then I mean the lateral wall will be formed by you know zygomatic bone portion of zygomatic bone you know as well as portion of the frontal bone and you know mainly by the greater ring of the sphenoid which will come to then of course the medial wall will be formed by the lacrimal bone yes the ethmoid bone ethmoidal bone will also contribute you know the orbital process of the ethmoidal bone will also contribute as well as even the frontal bone contributing the formation of the medial wall then for the lateral sorry for the floor or the inferior part of the wall is going to be contributed mainly by the you know maxillary bone the maxilla is going to contribute and of course we are going to also have the palatine bone also contributing to it yes even a, apart from that we're also going to have some portion also coming from the zygomatic bone also contributing to 
you know, the flow of the orbital cavity. But mainly what we find is that the frontal bone is going to form, you know, the roof of the orbit. Now, what we find is that this part is very flat and therefore we call it the squamous part of the frontal bone because this portion is forming the roof of the orbit, we call the orbital part of the frontal bone. Now, what we find is that as we go, you know, posteriorly, we find another bone. There are two bones. Remember that the frontal bone is actually one in the adult. But in fetal life, you know, as well as, you know, immediately postpartum, usually it's going to be two, having two bones, two bones which are connected by a suture known as metopic suture. Now usually as one gets delivered as air continues to you know blow over the forehead, what happens is that it tends to begin to ossify, to begin to fuse. And usually by age eight it gets contribute completely fused. But some adult individuals may still have persistent you know metopic suture. Yes, I mean connecting these two bones which are known as parietal bones, which we'll get to. And this frontal bone is, you know, a suture which is connecting them. But remember that sutures are actually dense fibrous, you know, connective tissues, which are going to connect bones of the scalp. Now this suture, because it runs in the coronal plane, we call it coronal suture or frontal suture, coronal suture. But because again it's between the frontal bone and the two parietal bones, we also call it frontoparietal suture or parietal frontal suture. Now, another striking thing that we find is that these two parietal bones, yes, they are two, they also be separated by a suture. And this suture is known as sagittal suture because we run in the mid sagittal plane, the vertical plane of the body mid-sagittal plane, therefore we call it sagittal suture, where we can also call it interparietal suture because it's between these two parietal bones. Now what we find is that the coronal suture meets the sagittal suture at this point, and this intersection is known as bregma, bregma, B-R-E-G-M-A, bregma. Now this bregma actually, yes, used to be a soft spot, Yes, in fetal life and then in neonatal life, is you know used to be a soft spot known as fontanelle. Yes, these soft spot actually we call it soft spot, but are, they are actually strong. I mean membranes which connect them. Now this soft spot, yes, let me show it. There's a fetal, I mean brain, I mean uh, skull. This bregma used to be this frontal known as anterior fontanelle or frontal fontanelle which is actually diamond shaped, diamond shaped. Yes, these fontanelles are actually going to allow for root of the brain, accommodate increase in size of the brain. They're also going to help in, you know, modeling of, you know, the skull as it goes through the birth canal. Yes, and yes, in some cases, yes, the blood can be taken from this area. Yes, and, you know, can be for various analysis through the superior sagittal sinus. So if you go through this area, then you are going to get what we call the superior sagittal sinus, superior sagittal sinus that you can find here. And then, you know, that blood could be used for various analysis. Now, this diamond shaped, yes, fontanelle is what is going to give rise to this bregma that we find here. Therefore, this bregma is actually finding itself between the frontal bone and then the two parietal bones, the two parietal bones. So that's the, I mean, the frontal bone is going to form, you know, the anterior aspect. It's going to form the roof of the cranial cavity. And that roof of the cranial cavity is also going to contribute to the floor of, so roof of the orbital cavity, orbital socket. It's actually going to contribute to the floor of the cranial cavity, of the cranial cavity. Now, the other bone that we want to look, look, at, look at is the parietal bones. These parietal bones, yes, we said they are connected by the sagittal suture. These parietal bones are going to have these eminences that we find here, known as parietal eminences. Yes, apart from that, we are going to have these foramina, these two foramina over here, 
and these foramina are known, known as the parietal foramina and you know they allow for the passage of the emissary vein and therefore you to call it the emissary foramina you can call it that so um what we find is that yeah the word parietal means wall and therefore you know you form majority of the roof of the cranial cavity posterior aspect of the cranial cavity majority of it will be formed by the you know the parietal you know bones yes apart from that they will form also the lateral walls of the cranial cavity yes and then we find these i mean landmarks these prominent landmarks that we find here which are very prominent in some people especially when they take off every hair of theirs you find these prominent lines which are known as temporal lines now remember that we are looking at the parietal bone but we are having temporal lines so it means that they have to do with something to do with you know the temporal bone there are muscles you know known as temporalis muscle with its fascia now the superior temporal bone will accommodate to give attachment to the temporalis fascia and then the superior inferior temporal bone will give attachment to the inferior temporal um, to, to the temporal the belly, fleshy muscle of the temporalis muscle temporalis muscle now one thing that is you know confusing to many students is this suture known as squamosal suture this squamosal suture it tends to confuse students between you know there's that confusion between these temporal lines and the squamosal suture now if it's a suture then it's not going to be smooth it's going to have these you know ridges it's like you've knitted something together and that is it i mean you're going to have that it's not going to be that smooth you're going to have these as if you've knitted you know things together so that is the i mean the parietal bone now if you look at the inner aspect which you look at you will realize that you have some grooves for actually the the middle meningeal arteries you know branches of the middle and meningeal arteries will find you know we find the grooves over there now what we find is that yes as you come posteriorly there is another bone there is another bone and this bone from the posterior aspect as well as the base of the skull is known as the occipital bone occipital bone now this occipital bone yes is also going to get some connection between the parietal bone bones and the occipital bone by way of sutures and this suture is known as the lambdoid suture lambdoid suture now this lambdoid suture you know is going to separate it, these two bones therefore you can also call it parietal occipital suture parietal occipital suture now between this lambdoid suture and the sagittal suture there's also another connection and this connection this intersection is known as lambda lambda and this lambda you know is triangular shape the way lambda has to do you know a triangle triangular shape structure this lambda used to be a soft port a fontanel and this fontanel is known as the posterior fontanel posterior fontanel so let me show you the posterior fontanel it's actually triangular shaped in the fetus as well as in the unit you are going to have this fontanel going to accommodate you know the brain now let me say something the anterior fontanel okay anterior fontanel because it's very large you know it's the last to get you know completely fused you know it will take something like you know 18 to 24 months to get completely fused you know yeah, approximately two years to get completely fused but the posterior fontanel because the triangular shape very small it will take you know barely two to three months for it to get fully fused or fully acidified so that becomes the lambda lambda now having seen that now we will look at the occipital bone um, and this occipital bone if you can see there is this prominence which often you see it at the back of people this prominence 
who is simply known as Inion, I N I O N, or external occipital protuberance. I mean, there is an internal occipital protuberance which we look at external occipital protuberance or Inion. And just on either side, lateral, as you move laterally on either side, we have this superior nuchal line. And below it, we are going to have the inferior nuchal line. Now, in between these nuchal lines and even below the inferior nuchal line is the crest, known as external occipital crest, external occipital crest, external occipital crest. So we look at all those, you know, bony attachments, you know, muscles which are going to attach when we look at the myology pretty soon. Now, as we move on, okay, we get to the basilar part, the base of the occipital bone, the basilar component of the occipital bone. Now, this basilar component is having a very large foramen, known as foramen magnum. You know, magnum has to be large, big, foramen magnum for the transmission, of course, you know, of the medulla oblongata, you know, continuation of the spinal cord. As well as you know the meninges and other structured neurovascular bundle or you know, structures. Now, anterior laterally to this, I mean, foramen magnum is this convex shaped, you know, articular process, which we call occipital condyles. Occipital condyles, and these occipital condyles are going to you know form this articulation with the you know, articular surface on the lateral masses of the atlas, forming the atlanto occipital joint. Atlanto occipital joint. Yes, this atlanto occipital joint, yes, it's going to help one, you know, to nod. I remember atlanto asial joint is going to have help in, you know, shaking of the head from left to right or rotating, you know, the head. Now, so essentially these are the main things but what we find you know is that there is some kind of let me show it here there is you know this foramen this foramen over there where the occipital condyles are located and this the medial part of the occipital condyle is known as the hypo uh, uh, glossal canal hypoglossal canal because the hypoglossal nerve with the cranial nerve 12 will go through it now on the posterior aspect to posterior lateral aspect to there is another you know, canal known as occipital condylar canal. So that one will also be here, occipital condylar canal for the occipital emissary vein. Occipital emissary vein, um, occipital condylar canal for the occipital emissary vein. Yes, so here is it for the occipital emissary vein. Now, so that is the, I mean, we've seen the frontal bone, we've seen the parietal bone, yes, we've also seen the, you know, occipital bone. So we look at the temporal bone, the temporal bone. Now remember that the parietal bones are two, occipital one, frontal one. So let's look at the uh, temporal bones, temporal bones. So this the temporal bone yeah the reason being that yes as time elapses that is where gray hair tends to you know most of the time begin growing and this temporal bone is very important because you know the auricular apparatus you know find you know salvage you know in this place they have refuse you know around this place now this is the squamous part squamous part of the temporal bone you know around the temple the temporal bone and 
we're also going to have this process which is shaped like breasts so we call it mastoid process mastoid process breast shaped yes anterior medial to the mastoid process is this pen shaped or rod shaped fracture which is known as styloid process this styloid process is when we actually give attachment to the you know stylo i mean uh, uh, or stylo hyoid muscles you know, stylo hyoid muscles are going to have you know attachment here now again we are going to have this this bone where is the you know the mastoid process you know for the you know stenocleidomastoid which we look at those muscles you know in no time we look at them now again there is you know intermedial to the mastoid process we find this opening known as external acoustic meatus or we also call it external auditory meatus now what we find is that yes it gives off this process which because it's going to accommodate articulate with the zygomatic bone the process from the zygomatic bone we call it the zygomatic process of the temporal bone so the zygomatic process of the temporal because it's going to articulate to the zygomatic bone zygomatic process of the temporal bone yes there is this petrous part which is the hardest you know part of the bone in the body but remember that you know the petrous is not this it's not the hardest you know substance in the body because you look at the tooth you have the enamel you know followed by even a dentine of course before you go to the cement tube and of course you get to the bone actually beginning with the you know the petrous part peter you know has to do rock 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 so petrous part very rocky very hard all right we look at that one and apart from this there is this fossa over here there is this fossa and this fossa is known as the temporal fossa so that the head of the you know the uh, condylar process of the mandible will i mean come and fit here to form the temporal mandibular joint which we look at so i mean that is what we have that is what we have now so we've seen that the temporal bones are also going to be two we have two temporal bones two parietal bones one occipital bone one frontal bone yes we also have what we call the sphenoid the sphenoid bone so remember that just moving away from here we are going to look at the sphenoid bone which i will show you when we look at the other ones then as you go a bit deeper you get to the ethmoidal bone now remember this is the poena the posterior nasal aperture this is the anterior nasal anterior nasal aperture which we look at now so that is with the i mean um, uh, the bones that form the cranium which we look at the ethmoid as well as the you know the sphenoid bones now when we look at this for the fa facial bones most of them are irregular yes this is the nasal bones there are two nasal bones over here you know that's where the bridges of you know the spectacles tend to rest these are the nasal bones and if you move medially we are going to have what you call the lacrimal bone the lacrimal bone that are the tear bones so there are two nasal bones there are two lacrimal bones also and lacrimal bone is actually going to have what we call the lacrimal fossa yes which will contain what you call the lacrimal sac which will collect the tears and then send to the nasal cavity through the nasal lacrimal duct through the nasal lacrimal duct now 
this is a zygomatic bone you know cheek bones these zygomatic bones you know these are the prominences and we can find this over here now there's a process which is connecting okay going to articulate with the temporal bone therefore we have to call this one the temporal process of the zygomatic bone temporal process of the zygomatic bone and these are the prominences that we have then of course there are also going to be the articulation between of course there's a frontal bone and the zygomatic bone so by way of suture that will be frontal zygomatic suture or zygomatical frontal suture and then for the processes we are going to have what we call the frontal process of the zygomatic bone we're also going to have the zygomatic process of the frontal bone so these are how the nomenclature you know goes how the nomenclature goes now at the inferior aspects at the inferior aspects we are going to have this nasal i mean spine we are going to have this nasal spine which is over here um it's actually on the maxilla which we look at but there is this process which comes up which is known as warmer it's a single bone it's also part of the facial bones warmer then there are you know two other bones which are in the nasal cavity known as you know the middle and the inferior nasal conchi the middle and inferior nasal conchi the superior nasal concha or conchi are actually part you know of the sorry the superior and the middle nasal conchi are actually part of the etymol which we look at the middle sorry the inferior nasal conchi is actually separate bones they are two in number in the nasal cavity and what they do is actually they increase the surface area okay for the air that goes through the nasal cavity in the living they will be covered by mucous membrane you know so that they will help in giving warmth to it now i will look at other aspects pretty soon but remember that the skull you know up, up, together the brain is going to be very heavy therefore it has some air filled you know spaces known as paranasal sinuses these paranasal sinuses are going to help lighten the skull yes apart from that it's going to you know help serve as resonating chamber of sound it's essential this is what we are going to do they are actually you know four in number with bones which are going to have it simply with the mnemonic MEFs M for maxillary which we we'll look at and E for ethmoidal F for frontal and S for sphenoidal so MEFs will help you know these bones which have paranasal sinuses which will drain into the nasal cavity well, sometimes it could be affected by some infections, you know, bacterial infection leading to inflammation. And if it's not taken care quickly, it could be problematic, which you have to look at that. Now, let's, I mean, let me show you this. We are now going to look at them, but this area represents the greater ring of the sphenoid bone, the greater ring of the sphenoid bone. We said it's going to form the lateral wall of the orbit, greater ring of the sphenoid bone. Then medially, we are also going to have the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone. So we we'll look at that one. Now this is the maxilla, with the upper jaw bone. You know, you are having this alveolar margin with these pits, which will be occupied by the, you know, roots of the teeth. If you imagine yes this maxilla is actually having two bones it's actually made of two bones therefore there will be that inter maxillary suture inter maxillary suture will be there then yes of course because it's going to articulate yes with the nasal the nose we are going to have the nasal process you know going to have the suture you know nasal maxillary sutures that's the nomenclature so we're just looking at the bones and then connecting them. Now, if you look at 
the inferior portion of the bone realize that we can have some sutures over here but this is actually known as the palatine process of the maxilla and there's the horizontal plate of the palatine bone so palatine bone you know also consists of two bones so there are two palatine bones by interpalatine suture okay so there's still the intermaxillary suture but of course connecting this whole suture this whole area is forming what we call the hard palate the hard palate so the hard palate is actually contributing majority by the palatine process of the maxilla of course by as well as you know the horizontal plate of the palatine bone and therefore this suture is known as you know the vertical suture of the palatine process of let's say the hard palate and this being the transverse suture of the hard palate forming this you know cross this cruciate suture cruciate so you can see this cross that we find here cruciate suture so that is i mean what we have um we are going to look at the remaining aspects but let's see that this is coming from the okay which we are going to look at this okay is coming from the sphenoid bone the sphenoid bone which we look at is actually the keystone bone because it's able to articulate with all these bones of the scalp so it's very important the sphenoid bone the keystone bone and this is actually the lateral lateral pterygoid plates the medial pterygoid plates having the fossa the pterygoid fossa in between so we look at all those ones but if you look at the maxilla there will be a fossa there's going to be a fossa just you know internal to what we call or just posterior to the incisor you know central incisor teeth will be the incisive fossa which will actually bear the incisive canal for the transmission of the nasopalatine nerve nasopalatine nerve which you have to get to know so these are the various teeth you know the molars you know the premolars and what have you and we know the canine also being there with the uh, so that's the canine and these are the incisor teeth finding themselves in the alveolar margin alveolar margin alveolar processes now one thing that we find again is that there are two other soft spots which we call them the anterior lateral fontanel and then the posterior lateral fontanel so We are going to have the anterior lateral fontanel and then the posterior lateral fontanel. These are actually regular. They are irregularly shaped. Now the anterior lateral fontanel, okay, which usually we call it the sphenoidal fontanel, we will tend to fuse earlier, you know, around let's say three to let's say six months to get fused. And then the posterior fontanel, posterior lateral fontanel, which is also known as the mastoid fontanel you know around you know six months of postnatal life it will get fused and when they fuse the anterior lateral fontanel or the sphenoidal fontanel will become what we call the terion terion p-t-e-r-i-o-n terion and the terion which is over here usually is h shaped it's going to be the weakest point on the skull and it's going to be formed by these bones of course the sphenoidal bone is going to contribute the frontal bone the parietal bone as well as the temporal bone is going to contribute to the formation of the terion so the terion is that intersection and is formed by these four bones and it's coming from the anterior lateral fontanel or the sphenoidal fontanel for the posterior lateral fontanel, it's going to give rise to what we call asterion. Asterion. 
posterolateral fontanel is going to give rise to asterion a s t e r i o n asterion now this asterion is therefore formed because we said it's formed by the mastoid then of course you know the mastoid process of the temporal bone is going to contribute to it apart from that we are also going to have the parietal bones contributing as well as the occipital bone the other three bones are contributing to the asterion now remember that these sutures that we have yes sometimes there could be bones forming in between in between these sutures and therefore we call such bones wormian or sutural bones wormian bones or sutural bones yes the mastoid process which we talked about may have a foramen known as mastoid foramen mastoid foramen all right now so this is the general features that we find but there is one concept which is very important that is known as carbarium pluralis carbaria that's a skull cap or the vaults of the skull or the vault of the brain so let's look at the components of the vault of the brain now for the bones that form the skull cap there are four nothing more nothing less and these bones are the single frontal bone the paired parietal bones and the single occipital bone forming the skull cap so i said that if you look internally we are going to find these i mean grooves and these grooves are actually representing the middle meningeal arteries the grooves of the middle meningeal artery remember that the middle meningeal artery is going to go through the stylomastoid foramen middle meningeal artery yes we can see what we call the frontal spine and you know the frontal spine is you know a bit inferior to it you are going to have foramen sicum now this foramen sicum is you know blind and usually nothing will go through it but in case something should go through it then uh, it's going to be you know these nasal uh, emissary veins which are going to go through them you know go through them but usually it won't traverse anything now so of course as we said we, we talked about the occipital protuberance yes that one is also the internal occipital protuberance which is not very clear here but all those features we can appreciate all of them here now remember that these bones are flat bones they are going to have the external plates internal plate and then in between them will be deploy be deploy and this deploy is actually not compact you know having spongy bone but these plates will be more or less compact deploy d i p l o e deploy now so let's look at the base of the skull let's look at the base of the skull the basilar component of the skull and so the base of the skull which is very important that we have to know as well as some vessels and nerves important nerves going through them so we can see this yes this is the the crests okay of the frontal bone yes apart from that we are going to have this this is actually the ethmoid now the ethmoid is having this plate which is actually perforated like colanda and therefore we call it cribriform plate of the ethmoid cribriform plate of the ethmoid now remember that you have seen this crest known as cresta galli of the ethmoid bone ethmoidal bone then we said that this ethmoidal bone apart from these is also going to have the superior and middle nasal conchi superior and middle nasal conchi so that is the ethmoidal bone now these foramina are going to allow for the axons of the olfactory nerve that's the cranial nerve one you know to traverse through it to traverse through it now moving away from that we have what we call the sphenoid but before i talk about the sphenoid remember that this cavity which is the base of the skull normal basalis
is actually having these fossae, the anterior fossa, middle fossa, and then posterior cranial fossae. So these are the three fossae that we have. Yes, between the anterior fossa and the middle fossa will be separated by, you know, the lesser wing. So the lesser wing, okay, superior margin of the lesser wing of the sphenoid. Then in between the middle cranial fossa and then the posterior cranial fossa, we are going to have the superior margin of this bone that I said I will talk about, the petrous part of the temporal bone. Petrous part of the temporal bone. Now, you realize that, yes, the sphenoid is going to have wings. And that's why we have the lesser wing and we have the greater wing. So that is the greater wing and this is the lesser wing. Then it's going to have this body. This body mainly presenting with what we call cella tessica. Cella tessica. Now, importantly, the cella tessica is going to have this fossa which is known as pituitary fossa or hypophysial fossa because the pituitary gland is also known as hypophysis so that the pituitary gland will sit here cella tessica but of course the cella tessica is also having these components apart from the pituitary fossa is going to have what you call tuberculum celli tuberculum celli that you find here and then we're also going to have these anterior clinoid processes. There will also be posterior, uh, sorry, tuba, uh, dorsum celli, posterior part of the saddle, dorsum celli, so dorsal part of it. And we also have the posterior clinoid processes. And these clinoid processes are going to give attachment to the, you know, uh, the tenturium you know cerebelli cerebelli tenturium cerebelli okay all right now what we also find is that yes there is this groove when you look at you know just on the tuberculum celli you know posterior aspect of tuberculum celli we are going to have this chasmatic groove as well now so let's move on now we also find that there are some openings there are some openings in the body of the sphenoid and these openings are known as optic canal optic canal for transmission of the second nerve of the cranial bone of the cranial nerves which is known as optic nerve as cranial nerve 2 as well as the ophthalmic artery going through these canals optic canals now inferior to it okay we are also going to have this fissure known as supra orbital fissure supra orbital fissure and this supra orbital fissure is going to allow for the transmission okay of cranial nerve 3 oculomotor nerve cranial nerve 4 that's the uh, uh, trochlear nerve okay uh, cranial nerve you know six the obtuses as well as you know the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve cranial nerve five also allowing them to go through this now the next foramina that we find are actually these ones which run okay they run this way let's have a view over here and that's lateral okay posterior lateral to the superorbital fissure is known as foramen rotundum so just remember the mnemonic ross rotundum ovale spinosum rotundum ovale spinosum so foramen rotundum is going to allow for the passage of actually this uh, i mean the second division of the trigeminal nerve we don't have the maxillary nerve and then foramen ovale going to allow for the passage of the third division of trigeminal nerve with the maxillary nerve 
So just remember the mnemonic ROS. Now, if you look at the internal aspect, you can see there is this foramen. Now, this triangular shaped mass of bone, we say is the hardest bone, is part of the temporal bone, known as the petrous bone of the temporal bone. And this bone is housing the internal acoustic meatus. Internal acoustic meatus. And you know the internal acoustic meatus is going to allow for what you call the facial nerve, you know, as well as the, um, you know, labyrinthine, you know, artery, as well as the cranial nerve 8. Cranial nerve 8 also going to go through this, which is the uh, the, the cochlear nerve as well as the vestibular nerve, you know, vestibular cochlear nerve going through this. Now, yes, apart from that, we also have what we call some other foramina, some other foramina, which we can see here. So, anteromedially, we are going to have the carotid canal and then laterally we are going to have quisterolateral to it we are going to have the jugular foramen jugular foramen so carotid canal is going to allow for the passage of the internal carotid artery the jugular foramen you know the inferior petrosal sinus yes as well as the sigmoid sinus is going to you know pass through this so mainly a lot of these things are doing that but one thing that we find is that if you look at the internal aspect, yes, there's the internal internal occipital crests, okay, with the internal occipital protuberance, yes, all these as well as the nasal, you know, spine, uh, sorry, the frontal spine, are going to allow for the tenturium cerebelli to actually give attachment, you know, at this point. So. For now, uh, by way of you know this particular introduction, we've been able to go through the cranial nerves as well as the facial nerves. We will look at the head and neck anatomy. We look into more details of it. Thank you very much for your audience.